Thank you very much. Uh, for those of you who had the privilege of going up to Tolaga Bay yesterday, wasn't that truly inspiring? And it really gives us a true reminder of why we're all here. This forum was the creation of Paul Callaghan, a man with real vision for New Zealand, and one of our two few public intellectuals. Paul asked me to take over the scientific realm of this, I guess, when he sadly realised that he would not be able to do so. But I must say at this point, the real tribute goes to his organising and governing team uh, who are mentioned in the programme. They've done a tremendous amount of work and effort over the last few months uh, to pull this together. Paul saw resonance between the scientific origins of Cook's first visit to the South Pacific and using this year's transit to promote a true dialogue on the role of science and scholarship in New Zealand's future. But the focus was not to be a debate about what kind of New Zealand we wanted. After all, we can all roughly agree on that. We all want a high standard of living. We want it for everybody. We want greater social cohesion. And we want to achieve the necessary economic growth and prosperity without significant harm to the environment. And we also recognise increasingly that we cannot live in isolation, but a part of a world where the capacities of a nation state to control its destiny depend on an ever increasing um, number of relationships around the world and how a country manages those. Those of various political persuasions will have different views on what one needs to get there and the relative weightings to give each of these goals. That's indeed appropriate and, in fact, the delight of living in a democracy. But the simple reality is that everything we do involves trade-offs, sustaining 40% more people on the planet, many of them who will have the right to demand higher standards of living, will inevitably involve more energy consumption, more food, more water, more resource use. There's no, no, just no way around that. But how do we do that while protecting a planet that we've increasingly come to value and see to be at risk? Too much of the discussion has been rather trite, imagining that these trade-offs can be avoided. A much more sophisticated discussion is needed and science and technology will be essential in finding the appropriate solutions. Rather than, therefore, than debating the goals, what Paul and I decided upon was a dialogue between the scientists, scholars, and the community on how we can use science and scholarship better to advance New Zealand faster towards these goals. Our fundamental thesis is that we've under underestimated the critical role that science and scholarship can play in achieving these goals. There's no challenge that we'll face over the coming decades that does not depend on science. It's critical to our economic, our environmental, our social and cultural development. And this just does not mean science in the field or science in the laboratory. Science has a critical role to play in a public dialogue as we develop a national consensus on how best to manage these trade-offs. Science can also have a much better role to play in dealing with many complex policy issues in areas such as health, education and welfare. And all of this requires a much more scientifically aware, literate and engaged population. This will be essential if a participatory democracy such as ours is to navigate through the opportunities and threats associated with these challenges and the rapid changes that technology will bring. There are also important issues emerging as the very substrate of society moves from the physical to the cyber. The virtual world has created the problem how to discern reliable from less reliable information in a world smothered with information and polemic, increasing, leading to increasing confusion and indeed loss of confidence in science as a key source of knowledge. And I'll return to this issue of trust in a moment. So what is science? Science is not just a collection of facts. Rather, it's a particular way of observing the natural and built world so as to gain a better understanding of it. It's wrong to assume that science is about certainty. 
for in most of science, certainty is not possible. It's largely about reducing uncertainty. As the late Sir Peter Medawa, a Nobel laureate, once put it, science is a means by which we analyse the many things that might be true about the universe and pare them down to the few that are probably true. But science, both formal and formal, remains the only process we have to gather probably reliable information about the world on any scale and from any perspective. To reject this is to reject the very basis of logical assessment of the challenges we face. The one dimension of science that needs to be protected at all costs is the need for the collection and interpretation of data to be value free. Such freedom from bias is not easy. But while this formal face of science is often presented as a Western tradition that gained impetus after the Enlightenment, observation and the experiment have their presence in every culture. It's where the boundaries become observed, become, uh, but it's where the boundary between what is observed and what is believed become blurred that confusion can appear. And that's where much better understandings are needed between science and society. We're in danger of underestimating how much the nature of science has changed. It used to be focused on linear questions, those aimed at reductionist precision. But much science has undergone radical change, particularly as the biological, environmental and human sciences have come to dominate. Science now deals with complex, non-linear phenomena where certainty is not possible and there remain many unknowns and the answers are defined in terms of probabilities and uncertainty, levels of uncertainty. Much of biology and medicine is such complex science. But while these complex areas are the subject of interdisciplinary sciences, we are developing the tools to deal with them. But much complex science has another dimension. It involves values. Typical examples include food security, the use of genetic modification, dealing with a changing population, and climate change. These are all issues of high public concern and political complexity. Such science, sometimes called post-normal science, can be defined as the application of science to public issues where facts are uncertain, values in dispute, stakes are high, and decisions urgent. And so by the very nature of these characteristics, such science is now intimately linked to and intertwined with the values and concerns of the public and body politic. I spent time on this issue at the beginning of this forum because it's important that we do not put science on a lofty pedestal that it does not deserve to be on. Paul clearly saw that science was part of, not distinct from society. So science provides some forms of knowledge, but societal decisions are properly made on many other grounds with strong values domains, community values, public opinion, fiscal and diplomatic considerations are critical to policy making. Similarly, business takes many other domains into account in making its decisions. Because of this intertwining of values with knowledge, a further complexity arises. Science become the, can become the proxy for values of political debate which is essentially independent of the science. I think a current example is the ongoing confusion about anthropogenic climate change. While there are real knowledge gaps, most of that debate is not really about the presence or not of climate change. Rather, it's being used as a proxy for a values debate about economics and intergenerational equity. As scientists get drawn into such debates, they can turn into advocates for one position or another and risk the loss of public trust. Scientists start, New Zealand is starting to use science better as part of policy development. Good information and evidence provides the essential base for a rational assessment of the options which must be then weighed up against those other criteria that politicians and their advisers must consider. Policy decisions are all too often dealing with complex systems with incomplete knowledge. And here, scientific approaches such as modelling, pilot studies and evaluation 
can play a much greater role than is generally accepted, especially as we now have much better tools to deal with such complex systems. But ultimately, the primary discussion at any level, from global to local, will be about the balance between resource conservation and resource exploitation, using these terms in the broadest, wider sense, broader sense. A mature conversation about this balance will depend on solid evidential base, which only unbiased science can provide, whereas the weighting of paths and priorities is based on values, which the whole community must own. But at this interface is a very complex interaction, which is reflected in the concept of risk. Risk means different things to different people. A scientist may talk of mathematical probabilities. A politician will think in terms of electoral risk. The, pu the public generally see risk through uh, a system one type of thinking, that is to use the decision theorist term, that is instinctively and emotionally. This can lead to some misunderstandings, and we need a much better conversation and dialogue so we all understand the different domains that have to come together as we think through these issues of risk. Technologies are developing all faster all the time, and they're having far greater impact as they project so much more quickly. The challenges for society to understand and accommodate these technologies at a pace commensurate with their development. Otherwise, some important technologies will be wrongly rejected or their harm overstated and others misused or their potential harm understated. In New Zealand, I think we've not given sufficient focus to, to, to technology assessment and technology forecasting. The conflict between the pace of development and understanding may be reflected in the rejection of science and a logical but understandable response to the pace of change. These issues are real and technological advances must be accompanied by a greater scientific literacy and a far better science community dialogue if a participatory democracy is to use science well. So finally, let's turn back to the question Paul posed for us. How can science take us to where we want to go? I think we can see science as having a, a range of purposes. Firstly, to create a society that values knowledge and to support the development of our people, our capabilities and capacities. Secondly, to enhance our understanding of who we are of our national identity, be it through understanding our peoples and their history, or our indigenous flora and fauna and our environment. And at the same time, we need research to understand and best manage our natural resources, both for both economic and conservatory reasons. We need to defend our society, our environment and our economy through research such as biosecurity research, environmental and public health research. We need to improve the effectiveness of our policy and public expenditure through areas such as health research, social science, and economic research, for example. We need science to support our trading and diplomatic interests, for example, through Antarctic research, science to report foreign aid, or the kind of research that supports the phytosanitary components of our trade agreements. That's a long list. And yet a notable feature of that list is that as important as those objectives are, I've not yet even talked yet about the most commonly advanced argument for investment in research, namely economic to benefit. Increasingly, research is undertaken for the critical, its critical role in driving innovation of direct economic benefit. But that's the topic of the next session, and I shall leave its expansion until I introduce that section. In essence, then, this meeting is designed to a, create a dialogue between those in the audience and those who have been invited to speak on how we can use science and scholarship to advance our economic, social, environmental policy and cultural ambitions. Paul and I both agree we have not used the sciences, the tools of intellectualism and science to our optimal advantage. 
Who wanted this meeting to address this deficiency? We wanted to make this country into a clever country. We both agreed that we need to be much more ambitious in the goals we set ourselves and less inward thinking. We need to move beyond our very incrementalist approach that we have in this country. Paul was never afraid of expansive thinking, but he generally had his feet on the ground. Our challenge is not to let him down. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sir Peter. Um, I'd next like to introduce um, Professor Charles Doherty, who is the director of the Alan Wilson Centre and also um, at Victoria University of Wellington. Charlie. Good morning, everyone. Um, Sir Peter's um, off to prepare for his next key role for us, uh, and he's asked me perhaps to, to just uh, reflect briefly for a few minutes as we change gears and begin to get into the um, formal sessions of this forum. Uh, I think coming after Mr. Peter, I would be unwise to, to talk about science. So I think I'll talk about the other half of, of, of the puzzle. And uh, uh, that's what we've experienced really so far. There's, there's a quote uh, in uh, one of Paul Callahan's quotes. It's on page five of your uh, program, don't look. Uh, but it's simply, uh, the, the essence of it is that science is our uh, way into the 21st century. And of course, that's the theme uh, today. What I'm always acutely aware of, and for those of you that were at the panel uh, last night, I think one of the themes that, that emerged was that that uh, way into the 21st century, of course, will be trod by uh, people, by all of us, and we all have our own takes on, on how that should happen. And I think that's what uh, um, uh, the next two days will be about. How do we do that? How do our do views differ? How do they come together? How can they come together? For those of you that were not fortunate enough to be here the last two days, uh, I'll just uh, very, very briefly review some of the things that uh, uh, we've done because they've been uh, quite exceptional uh, experiences. We uh, got here, uh, probably most of us not quite 48 hours ago, uh, had a wonderful warm welcome uh, on the first evening that included two different perspectives on the arrival of humans, well, on the arrival of uh, uh, Cook and the Endeavor and his men. Uh, 243 years ago at this very spot um, and, uh, and then went off and uh, had uh, dinners at uh, several venues where we all made uh, new friends and caught up with old friends and that was a, a, a wonderful experience. Uh, I had the good fortune to sit next to uh, uh, Matt from the Navy and I think uh, he's a naval meteorologist and uh, thank you for the weather Matt, well done. Uh, the forecasts uh, for yesterday were not uh, quite what they turned out to be. We were very, very fortunate. Uh, yesterday, we got on buses or drove ourselves up to Uauatulga Bay. We saw the uh, launch of the or uh, opening of the uh, newly restored wharf, and I think that achievement is a bit of a, a symbol for this this um, uh, gathering because uh, that's a, a local initiative that was expensive, that required a whole lot of people working together for an extended period of time uh, to ensure the restoration of that uh, uh, special wharf. Uh, we experienced uh, uh, some tree plantings at, at Tulaga Bay. We saw a time capsule being put away for 26 years with no explanation of what 26 years was all about. Um, <laughs> and, and we met a lot of people, and it was another chance really to talk to, 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 to new people, meet new people, uh, and, and uh, gain some new friends. Uh, I might, I think, just mention the thing that to me is the most uh, unusual about this event, and that's the diversity of the people that are here. I've got a list that I'll go through quickly. Uh, I apologize in advance because I will leave off some groups, uh, which just reflects how um, uh, 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 widely attended this meeting is. Uh, certainly, they're members of the Gisborne community. They're members of the local and national business communities. Uh, they're inevitably academics, sorry, but uh, we're here. They're representatives of NGOs. Uh, the Uawa Talaga Bay community is well represented, both uh, with uh, Te, Te Atanga Ahawati, uh, the local farming community, and other uh, local business people. There are public servants, there are politicians, and, and for those of you that were not there yesterday, uh, we had three ministers uh, at the formal ceremonies yesterday, uh, and they in fact acquitted themselves very well, despite some of them being under considerable pressure recently. Um, 
I think I may have mentioned public servants, uh, certainly young people, and I think that's, uh, while a lot of us here have a, a bit more gray hair than we might want, uh, the, the, the farm really is more about the future and, and about young people, and they've been extremely well, well uh, represented. I will remember uh, some of those young people from yesterday uh, uh, very much indeed. Um, and uh, lastly, uh, the Navy has been uh, well represented. Uh, and that's, a, uh, I think, to me, is a particularly significant thing. I don't often go to meetings with the Navy well represented, possibly never, uh, I'm not sure. But uh, I think in, in line with the theme of this meeting, it's, it's important that we remember that the Navy uh, was here 243 years ago. It was uh, a, a different Navy to some, in some ways, uh, but the same uh, 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 spirit, certainly, and uh, it was the Navy that uh, brought European culture here uh, meaningfully for the first time, and they connected with the people, of course, that have a strong uh, tradition of navigation. Science was fundamental to the Navy. Science, is, as we've been reminded repeatedly, uh, it was absolutely fundamental to the founding of our nation, and that's probably uh, possibly uh, uh, to a quite unusual uh, extent. So uh, uh, the role of the Navy has been critical, and of course not not only at the founding, uh, the Navy uh, has had an almost continuous presence, uh, I suppose for 160 or 70 years, uh, but uh, the Navy was here in 2004 at the last transit, uh, and I have every confidence they will be here at the next one. So thank, thank those of you in the Navy for your contributions uh, to this, this event. Uh, I should say also it was a pleasure to wake up this morning and look across the river and see uh, one of your ships, so that was a treat for us too. All of those people are components of the dual heritage shared future theme of this event. Uh, the shared future is not a dual one now, of course, we're a multicultural uh, society in many respects, certainly uh, multi, multiple ethnic heritages, uh, but uh, from the perspective of the Alan Wilson Center, uh, I just remind you, as Alan Wilson uh, told us, that uh, we're all African to begin with, so we all have a common origin. Uh, a few hundred, about 150,000 uh, years ago. Uh, I do wonder if last night's panel discussion isn't quite a preview of the next two days. As Sir Peter said in his uh, remarks a few minutes ago, um, uh, we probably largely agree on the targets. We want, uh, you know, a, a strong economic future for the country. We, we want a cohesive society, and we want an, a, a healthy environment. And of course. Paul Callahan in his Kiwi Bank uh, New Zealander of the Year lectures all of last year always made that link between a strong economy and a healthy environment. He did not see the two as separate. He saw those as going hand in hand and that in fact we might not have that strong uh, uh, and wealthy future if we don't have a healthy environment. Why would talented, wise, intelligent people want to come here if we didn't have that? Uh, so uh, let's remember that link, please. Um, I think for me, the, personally, uh, the other thing that I've already uh, experienced is, is some new perspectives. After the panel uh, session last night, when I thought people might be keen to race away to the pub, what in fact ensued was a series of uh, individual conversations where I met some new people, learned some new things, and heard some new ideas. And, and as I said, these are people that I might not normally uh, run into at a scientific conference, and uh, so it, it uh, uh, gave me some, some things to think about and ideas to pursue, and I hope that happens to every one of you. Uh, we also had in the panel session last night some uh, disagreement. Uh, the, the view was strongly expressed by Gareth Morgan that uh, the only meaningful change really is, is incremental, let the individual go for it and do what they want. Sir Peter has just exhorted us to uh, think much bigger, to, to talk about step changes, to talk about uh, uh, really big ideas to have to raise our horizon and go further and of course uh, we may not differ too much as I said in where we want to be but how we get there will will be the different pathway and one of the key questions last night and it's perhaps it's where I should end was what can can I as an individual do and and that's what those conversations I've already had with some people uh, have have uh, caused me to think much more uh, carefully about uh, uh, and I think that's a key question for all of us because uh, Paul Callahan would have wanted us to go away from here uh, inspired uh, and ready to, you know, I think, inspire others and, and uh, help them ask those questions themselves. How can we be involved directly in uh, making New Zealand a better place and giving New Zealand a better future? Uh, so I hope you um,
go away the, with the same positive memories I do. I think one I will particularly remember is that young woman uh, at the school yesterday who spoke and uh, who w w told us quite clearly that her uh, life's goal was to become a marine biologist. Uh, I can only wish her well. I hope she achieves it. I expect she actually will achieve it. Uh, she seemed pretty committed to me, and I think it was clear to me how committed those young people were uh, to a strong future for their local community. So uh, have a good conference, everyone. I hope you have uh, as many good experiences in the next two days as I expect to do so. Um, and uh, with no further ado, I will stop now and uh, invite the Navy to come forward and uh, uh, formally initiate things today uh, with a Wyatta. So, thank you.
So that was pretty awesome. <laughs> um, so now we've got the very first session of the forum um, and the format, Peter will go through the format for each of the sessions to come um, and I hand over to Sir Peter. Thank I'll you. Ask the panel to come up please. This first session is focused on the issue of science in New Zealand's prosperity. And we have five panellists uh, this morning, and the format that we'll use is a format that's used extensively around the world in interdisciplinary dialogues in places like Davos, the United Nations uh, Economic Council, uh, uh, Science Technology Forum, and so forth. Namely, the chair will give a about a 10 minute overview. Sorry, you've got to hear from me again. And then each of the speakers will, will, will have seven minutes to make some points without any interruption or, or, or between each of them. And then we will open up for a dialogue from the floor. Anybody from the floor can come up to one of the two microphones and either make a question or a comment. Uh, Please, no more than two minutes per person at the microphone if you want to make a comment rather than a question. And remember, this is being live broadcast. Uh, so uh, you may want to think about uh, how we say things. Um, so let me just introduce this session. You'll see, as it goes, this turns into a very effective dialogue where there's a chance for the audience to truly to engage with the, with, with the panel and out of that, I hope by the end of this meeting, we will be able to bring together the various strands of, this, of the various sessions so that we can actually have a view of how we can use science and scholarship better in taking New Zealand forward. 
So let me start by making some comments in relationship to science and our nation's prosperity. We are a small nation and somewhat geographically remote. We've got a tendency, I think, as a society to be rather self-satisfied with our lot and not as ambitious as we may need to be to thrive over the coming decades. After all, selling food and tourism has been relatively easy. But sadly, exports as our percentage of our economy are falling. It's not realistic to imagine that we can achieve as a small nation the kind of prosperity we want by just looking inward. We only have to look at global financial conditions to see how vulnerable the small nation state has become to an irreversibly globalised economy. Our citizens generally want more prosperity, and the issue is how do we create a society and economy that does this. When one looks around the world, the most successful advanced countries in the last decade, in the, at least in economic terms, have been the small countries. Countries like Denmark, Singapore, Korea, Israel, Finland have all managed to withstand the economic storm much better than most. And they've done so because they've become knowledge intensive economies. And if you look at these countries, several consistent themes emerge. It's clear that smallness does drive a culture of doing more than with less, although there is a limit to that concept. And we may be at that in places. And while we may not often think we do it well, technology transfer tends to be more efficient in small countries. Smallness forces small countries and small companies to focus on thinking globally. They fail if they do not. It also allows them to promote interdisciplinary research where most of the most exciting innovation in science comes from. And it's perhaps something we've not emphasized enough as an advantage in our small country. On the other hand, we, unlike the other small advanced countries, have failed to yet attract multinational com companies to see value in using New Zealand as a knowledge base. Yet, for many reasons, should we should be able to do so. And this raises the question, should we be partnering more with the other small countries? All said and done, teams are made by marrying different skills together and some of these other small countries, such as Singapore, have skills and capacities and capabilities we do not have. One of my more recent and interesting conversations was with Saul Singer, an author of Startup Nation, the book that documents and explains Israel's rapid emergence as a hothouse of startup activity. We discussed how countries look at themselves. He said it so pithily. Finland has startup envy. Israel has Nokia envy. His point was that every country has its own path innovation and must build on what they're excellent at. Yet nations are good at taking for granted what they're good at rather than using that to build on and create excellence. And I suspect, looking around the room, a lot of you can feel resonance with that statement. We've not been good at building on what we're good at. In a technological age, multi-factor productivity growth can occur either through imitation, that is by taking knowledge from offshore, or by frontier innovation, that is science, and other forms of innovation. But as countries get closer to global front knowledge frontiers, it's the latter that has greater impact on growth. While knowledge transfer and absorption promotes growth well in low GDP countries, in high-income countries, it's no longer enough to have high absorptive capacity, but to be competitive as a nation, it must also have high frontier innovation. And that's true even for New Zealand, which even if it cannot do everything. And that creates why the university sector is so important to our economic growth. Several clear messages have emerged. Firstly, the linear model of the relationship between investment in individual research projects and impactful exploitation is now rejected in favour of a much more holistic approach. It is generally accepted that assessing the return on R&D is a complicated process with a long lag time 
that makes linear models somewhat meaningless, even though some Treasury departments still like them. While it's difficult to assess the direct benefits of public R&D expenditure on economic growth, there is a consensus about its importance and its ability to generate growth and prosperity. Annual returns may well be in the order of between 20 and 40%. There's also growing evidence that public investment in R&D does not displace private sector investment, but in fact increases it. While many countries have tried to look at the issue of impact in, of research investments and the broader issues of the social and policy returns above the direct economic benefits, the reality is that such quantitative assessments are difficult and artificial. That does not mean that just because we cannot measure it, we should ignore it. A saying that's often attributed to Einstein, whether he said it or not, I'm not sure, is that not everything that we can measure is important. Not everything that's important can be measured. A further point is that while the science and innovation systems ecosystem intersect, they're not the same. Not all innovation comes from science and not all science is driven by the need to innovate. But without a commitment to and a culture of scholarship and inquiry, innovation of the type that will lead to prosperity and economic advancement at the scale we need is not imaginable. While relevance and impact will be core to research prioritization, there's a need to sustain a high corpus of research for ideas generation. Indeed, that is the primary role of universities. Businesses then have the role of filtering those ideas and turning them to product. In this session, we focus on, it, on the role of science in promoting direct economic growth and prosperity. This leads to two key questions. Firstly, what is it that we're doing well, that we could do more of, much more of? And second, what is it that we're not doing much of, but where we have a clear competitive advantage? Remember, we will not get rich from our own small internal market, but only increasing our sales to the ever-increasingly interdependent world. The answers are not easy because whatever we do, there are trade-offs. Risks have to be evaluated and managed. We obviously have the potential to much increase our dairy output, but what are the consequences and risks associated with doing so? <laughs> Sonny will speak about that later in this program. And what are we not doing well now that we have a competitive advantage in? Paul would have argued that given this quality of our STEM education, that science, technology, ed, uh, engineering and mathematics education, we have advantages in high value manufacturing in areas such as medical technologies. But our ecosystem for, economic, for innovation is not well developed, although much change is happening. What do we have to do to develop the capital markets, the partnerships, the, the arrangements to go to scale. How do we deal with the manifest gaps in managerial and entrepreneurial leadership? How do we learn to value risk takers even when they're likely to fail and after they've failed so they can start again? That's at the heart of a country that's more innovative. We have five speakers in this session. The order will be Derek Hanley, then Sean Hendry, then Caroline Saunders, Murray Bain, and Peter Crisp. I'm not going to introduce each of them because their biographies are, 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 in, are in, this, in, in the handbook. Rather, I want to use the time for the discussion. As I said, each speaker will have seven minutes, after which I may allow a little interpanel discourse before opening to the floor. Please come to the microphones to come forward, and then, uh, and then we will enjoy the discussion. So without further ado, I'd like to ask Derek Hanley to uh, start the ball rolling. Thank you. Um, if, all, if all cultures were brought up to sing like that, and like the kids from uh, yesterday, with all the challenges we've got, at least we'd have a much better sounding um, world. So I think we should think about those kind of changes as well. Uh, Peter's comments earlier um, really are quite a good setup for the things that I was going to talk about. As you mentioned, we live in a world where if the entire world consumed as the Americans do, 
Uh, we need four and a half planets today to, um, to make that work. And we will be welcoming two billion additional people to our family over the next 30 to 40 years. And they all want to consume in the ways that we do. So we're on the threshold of some really enormous risks um, as a country, but also as a world, and on the threshold of uh, enormous responsibilities. But importantly, if science and innovation and business play the right role, we're also on the threshold of, of significant rewards. The bad news is that as we continue to consume and live and sustainably as we do, uh, we will continue to push our way forward to the very limits of the planetary system and also the social ecosystem. And because we're not sensible and we can't make the long-term decisions that we know uh, are right, we will undoubtedly continue to push towards those limits. The good news is, as we go down this path, the challenges that have previously been thought of as social problems that are relegated to NGOs or governments, or the environmental problems that have been relegated to the passions of tree, hung tree huggers or environmentalists, are now rapidly becoming very real business problems. And with, when issues become business problems or opportunities, you're dealing with a whole new beast in terms of a force for change and a force for innovation and a force for progress. And we're starting to enter an era where companies like Kraft and Nestle, as they plan and look down the pipe and see very genuine resource constraints and society constraints, are being forced to collaborate instead of compete, for example, in order to protect and develop a global, a global cocoa supply chain right down to the farmer by farmer level in order to avoid running out of chocolate in the decades to come. This at the same time forces them to get involved in communities to lift people out of poverty and towards prosperity. This interlinks the planet, people, and profits into their business model. And this is an, an indication of the future of business. It is at the intersection of social purpose, planetary responsibility, and financial profit that the future of capitalism and economic welfare lies. It's an age which requires new thinking beyond pure financial profit, and an age which requires scholarship and science to get us there. Yet today, despite all this, despite knowing all of this, both here and abroad, we blindly continue to define our success and to measure it in three out dangerously outdated letters, GDP. These three letters represent an economic construct and a model for industrialism that is no longer relevant today with the challenges that we face. The world is very, very different now to when these words were, were uh, invented. It's far more interconnected, it's totally interdependent, and it needs radically new ideas to solve the problems that we have created. As Robert Kennedy spoke about 50 years ago, he said GDP is ill-suited for the things that matter most to us. It counts the destruction of our waterways, it counts the cost of the courts and the police we use to try our criminals and the jails that we throw them into. It counts the hospitals we need to care for the obese, the drunk and the abused. And it does not count how healthy as a nation we are, how fit and nutritious our diets are. And it does not include the beauty of our country, the environment or the sustainability of our fisheries. It does not factor in how clever our children are, how purposeful their lives will be and how creatively they are taught to think. Ultimately, GDP does not count nor care about all the things that are actually going to make us happy, the things that actually make life worth living and that are true sustainable prosperity. By the time we have reached our goal of catching up to Australia's GDP, it is my firm belief that the collision of the evolution of the consciousness of what it means to be successful and the constraints of our planet will have evolved so much that we may, we, we may well realize that that goal is not a goal worthy pursuing, or at least it's not worthy pursuing in the way we currently measure it. So for me, science and scholarship, and not just economists, must play the lead role in redefining what it is in fact we are seeking to measure in the first place as a nation. What is it is we seek to dream of and be measured by? 
And just as we pioneered the vote for women and the climbing of mountains, we need to pioneer the new metric of what it means to be successful as a country. We need to be a country that leads the charge in defining a paradigm beyond GDP. Whether it be gross national welfare or some other means, we need to move away from measuring success in terms of strictly dollars, cents, and profit to one of people, planet, and profit. To move us from an era dominated by the science of economics to an era that needs to be dominated by the economics of science. The one major thing I've never agreed with Sir Paul on was that he believed we'll be good at what we'll be good at. By default, this is true. It's a cop-out, but by design, it falls short. Tiger Woods, Serena, Serena Williams, and Michael Schumacher are not good at golf, tennis, and F1 because they woke up and became good at it. They're good at it because their parents chose for them to be good at it and started them playing at ages two, four, and five. As a country, we are parents of future generations. With extremely limited resources, we must take a much more robust systems approach to defining where we need to focus. Whatever the top 10 science and technology problems are that, if solved, enable us to maximize yield to feed the 9 billion people of 2050, we must become good at that. Whatever the top 10 areas of scholarship, if answered, enable us to live in a regenerative and closed-loop society where everything we waste becomes feedstock for everything we make, we must become good at that. These are the export markets of the future, these are the pathways to prosperity, and these are the business models of tomorrow. And our greatest opportunity is choosing to be good at them. I'm honored to be here. Thank you for having me. Hi, uh, my name's Sean Hendy. Um, I'm a theoretical physicist, and I'm going to give you a, a theoretical physicist's take on uh, innovation and how innovation works. I'm going to try and leave you with uh, three key ideas that perhaps we can take up for further discussion. Um, so, so first of all, you know, this is a really interesting meeting. It's brought together a lot of people from a lot of different um, uh, fields and walks of life. Um, one of the things that we have in common is we all seem to talk about ecosystems. We heard um, uh, Sir Peter uh, talking about innovation and science ecosystems. And, of course, last night we, we had um, people talking about real ecosystems and how we protect our natural environment. Um, I'm going to tell you how a theoretical physicist now thinks of an ecosystem. So here, here's an ecosystem. This is probably how most of us picture it, a nice sort of sunny uh, green forest. Here's how a theoretical physicist uh, looks at it. Right, we, we think of it in terms of data. Right, this is the distribution of biomass in an ecosystem. So, so what I'm looking at is, um, is the density of particular plants in a forest and how much they, basically how much they weigh. Right? So we, we, we have um, a very few large trees, totara or, or kauri trees, um, and then we also have a, a large number of smaller plants like grasses. And so this is, a, this is a theoretical physicist way of looking at an ecosystem in terms of data. It turns out if we look at innovation ecosystems, we get very much the same picture. So this is actually the distribution of intellectual property amongst firms. Uh, the red data is the distribution of intellectual property amongst firms in the United States. Uh, the green data is Finland. Uh, the uh, blue data is Australia, and the black data is New Zealand. And it turns out those distributions are actually very, very similar. Um, and, and so it, when you're talking about an innovation ecosystem, you're actually, you know, the analogy with, with real ecosystems is actually very, very strong. So that's the first sort of idea I wanted to leave you with, that actually when we're talking about uh, innovation ecosystems, we're not just using a, a weak metaphor, we're using something that, that theoretical physicists are, are happy to quantify. And if a theoretical physicist is happy with it, well, that's saying something. But that's not necessarily a useful way of looking at innovation for everyone. I mean, I, I get a lot out of that diagram. But there are, there are other ways of looking at innovation ecosystems. And um, one thing that we've looked at is, is where, where is innovation taking place? So this is a map that we put out a couple of years ago. And we've geolocated geo uh, all the inventors in New Zealand. So we, we went through the, uh, a patent database, uh, pulled out names, and found out where people lived. And um, we then put a little dot on the map uh, showing where in different inventors live, um, and we went a little, we went a step beyond that, um, where inventors co-invented, um, where, where they had actually co-invented something. We drew a line between those inventors because we assumed that meant that they were collaborating on something, and you'll see that it's actually a, a very dense 
network of, of people working together in New Zealand. Uh, pleasingly, there is someone <laughs> from, from this region. Um, you can see that, in, in fact, in, in Gisborne, um, I don't know if the person's here, maybe they want to stand up. Um, I'd be really interested to meet them. Uh, but, but actually it does turn out that if you're in Gisborne, you're less likely to invent something than if you're in Palmerston North. And if you're in Palmerston North, you're less likely to invent something than if you're in Wellington. And if you're in Wellington, you're less likely to invent something than if you're in Auckland. And if you're in Auckland, you're less likely to invent something than if you're in Sydney. And if you're in Sydney, you're less likely to invent something than if you're in Tokyo. And this is something that we face. This is the issue of scale in New Zealand. And it actually turns out that it's these big cities uh, that are the drivers of innovation uh, internationally. And so, so most intellectual property is being developed in these big cities. So why is that? Well, actually, economists and theoretical physicists and sociologists are still arguing over this question. What I think is going on is, is it's about the connectivity of people in cities. We've looked at how scientists are connected by scientific articles in cities, and we actually find that the bigger the city, the denser the network of scientists working together. So from this point of view, from my point of view, cities uh, generate innovation because they generate dense collaborative networks. Now you might think, again, you know, we went to Tolaga Bay yesterday, and it's quite possible that everybody knows everybody else and, and their business in, in Tolaga Bay. Because if you go back, when I go back to Wellington, you know, I won't meet many people I know um, on, on Lambton Quay. I'll meet a few. But actually, within Wellington, I have a very dense network of, of interconnected people with the skills around me that I can use to innovate. Um, and that's actually what's going on in, in big cities. So in New Zealand, what we really need to do, and this is, this is my second key message, is we need, to, we need to collaborate nationally. We need to take full advantage of our four million people. We need to create a city of four million people by building connections. So, so we need more people inventing in Gisborne, and those people need to be connected with the rest uh, of New Zealand. Okay, so my last key message is to try it. We've, we've already... I uh, heard the, uh, Sir Peter and Derek talk about developing new areas of comparative advantage. This is how a physicist looks at, um, at products. Okay, so this is, a, this is a very messy diagram, but it's been uh, developed by a, a number of physicists at Harvard University. And they're looking at comparative advantage and how different products, if you have a comparative advantage in one product, do you tend also to be able to develop a comparative advantage in another product? And you can build this network diagram that links different products together based on how comparative advantage tends to evolve as, and is developed. So things like oil, so, um, so oil is right out here, it's a commodity, right? It, you know, having comparative advantage in, in oil just means that you've got some buried under the ground, right? It doesn't actually give you a lot of other economic opportunities. Whereas if you're, um, if you're working in uh, electronics or the, or the health industry, right, having, developing a comparative advantage in these areas tends to give you a lot of other economic opportunities. Um, and so you can use this map as a way of looking at your strengths and looking at perhaps where you should take your economy. Um, and so what, tends, what you tend to find is you, you see that, that rich countries tend to occupy the centre of the diagram. Okay? So they tend to be countries that are very productive and are rich tend to have products that come from that centre of the diagram. They have lots of economic opportunities available to them because they're making complex products. Countries that are less productive, so this is Russia for example, um, tend to sit out here um, at the periphery of the diagram. They tend to be exporting commodities. Okay? So Russia's a uh, uh, you know, an important source of energy and a lot of other commodities, um, but it's got very little in the centre here. It's got very little op economic opportunity from its own comparative advantage. Let's just look at New Zealand for a second. Um, and you actually see that we're not doing too badly. Um, we actually have quite a large footprint in the centre of the diagram, but of course we do know that, that um, a, a, lot of our, uh, a lot of our exports are based on commodities, and so we do also have a lot of products that sit out here. Um, and so let's just put some labels out here. So we, things like seafood, right? Well, you know, the, Gisborne's a great place for seafood. I've had, I've had some great uh, seafood over the last couple of days. But it tends to give you fewer economic opportunities in terms of being able to develop new comparative advantage. So I'm, I'm just going to um, uh, finish on this and just point to where I think some of the greatest opportunities for New Zealand lie. And I think it's in this region here. We have companies like Fisher & Paykel Healthcare, which is exporting medical devices. Uh, we have companies like Gallagher's, which, which make agricultural machinery and other types of high-tech machinery. And we have companies like Raycon that are exporting uh, machine parts. And so I actually think we, we've got enough capability around the outside of this, this central area uh, in, in uh, product space that this is where we could build. If we focus simply on, on food, 
Um, sure, we could grow the, the, uh, uh, the, our exports in, in food, more complex foods, uh, more complex processed foods, but actually you'll see um, that, that, that by doing that, we give ourselves fewer economic opportunities. So I'm going to leave it there. Thanks very much. Um, I'm Caroline Saunders, based from sunny Lincoln. Well, apparently it's pretty white at the moment, and so um, not really at work today because the university is shut because of all the snow. Um, and um, thanks for that. That was, that was a brilliant lead into my one. Now, I'm an economist, and, um, you know, when I sort of hear about what, what an economist is, well, economics is maximising welfare subject to limited resources, which is why we've been given the label the dismal science. Um, now, what do we mean by um, welfare? Well, in economics, it isn't just the dollar. It's exactly what I would define the prosperity that I think is, is what we're meaning when we're having these discussions today. It's the social, the cultural, the economic, and the environmental. And we're not going to have prosperity unless we're looking at all those um, and how they're interlinked and how we can maximize those for our society subject to limited resources. Now, we've all heard about, oh, we're running out of oil and we're running out of this and we're, we're facing these limited resources. Well, the one limited resource we don't have is the human mind, and that's where science comes in. So I think it's obviously a no-brainer that if we're going to dig ourselves out of this hole, which we may have got ourselves into on the next two billion people or whatever things are going to hit us, then it's got to be through science. Then, of course, you know, we can all take our little positions here. So I've decided to take my usual little biases and a few positions this morning. Um, and, and the first passion I've got is around New Zealand science, and it's not just in New Zealand, other countries are too. Um, we tend to silo ourselves. And not even just with, within the natural sciences, you see silos appearing. But in particular, my passion is about between the natural and social sciences and about, it, you know, if we're going to get step changes that Sir Peter wants, the best way to do that is to start looking at integrating um, across natural social sciences and also humanities, bringing in the creative industries as well. Um, I loved that last example about the medical technologies. We do a lot of work with companies about innovation and things like this, and I can't resist this, that we interviewed a lot of medical technology companies about what factors would facilitate their success. And we went to one company that sells hip replacement equipment to the United States. And we said, why were you so successful? And he says, well, we make our tools sexy. Hip replacement tools sexy? It wasn't quite on my head space. He said, the surgeons, they love it. If it's tactile and we can feel it, and they feel sexy when they're talking whatever sells <laughs> in whatever markets. And that's where I go to my next thing, and those that have heard me before are probably just going to fall up and curl up in a ball and go to sleep. Because um, I appreciate we, we've got to innovate, we've got to develop our technologies, there are lots of ways we can add value, and there's lots of magic things going on around New Zealand. But let's not um, forget the elephant in New Zealand, which is our agricultural sector. Um, it's one of the ways we can, I think we could get quickest runs on the board if we wanted prosperity, and I mean genuine prosperity. And the win-win that we do in the unit was to go out and look and see where in the overseas market, what attributes do they want for the products? How can we enhance the value that New Zealand is getting? And, and I just don't even want to think of the word commodity, because even if it's milk powder, we shouldn't be selling it as commodities. We should be levering off higher value. And we're not low-cost producers. We're high-value producers, producing to high environmental social standards. And it's looking, overseas markets will pay premium for these segments um, where we can hit some of these attributes. And despite global crises, despite emerging countries which people think don't want these attributes, it's not true. So at the moment, we're going out surveying India and China and looking what the premium segments of those markets want that can enhance the value for our production. And so we get a win-win. So we're able to go down on the ground and talk to the producers and the farmers and say, if you farm in an environmentally and socially acceptable manner, we can actually leave a value added of those products for you. So we can achieve that win-win. That um, 
And so I see that by integrating across our environmental scientists, our social scientists, and, and our economists. Um, and it's interesting, we've just finished a project, it wasn't me in the unit, Professor John Fairweather did it. And P Peter Gluckman sort of introduced us about being small countries and where some of the levers had grown. Well, what John did, it was an MSI funded project, so thank Murray. Um, he went round and looked at the different innovation rates across different countries, the small countries, and saw what was different in their cultures that led to innovation or them having higher rates of GDP. I know, I know, I know. Um, let's say genuine progress indicators or something like another matrix we'll use. And the thing that stood out for me about New Zealand, in New Zealand we don't, the general public doesn't respect science or education as these other countries did. So maybe that's another place we can start too. Thank you and good morning. Good morning, I'm Murray Bain, MSI. Thanks for the plug, Carolyn, much appreciated. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today. Sad to be here without Paul, uh, but good to keep moving on the journey that he started us on. We know, as we've heard, that over the last 30 years, relative to most developed countries, New Zealand's wealth has slowly fallen. We've started to see the real effects of this beginning to come through, as we end up needing to make a whole lot of unpalatable choices in areas like health services, education, recent budget stuff, for example, social support, environmental management. These are all things that actually help us determine our well-being as a people. Slow downward drifts are a challenge in any sphere. Burning platforms are actually much better in a way. Germany and Japan were able after World War II to reinvent themselves economically and in a whole lot of other ways. The collapse of the Soviet Union and the Russian economy forced both Israel with its massive immigration challenge that it had to face and Finland with the collapse of its forestry exports to make major strategic decisions that today have increased their wealth and their ability to provide services for their people in a much better way. These burning platforms are recognised by society and therefore are enabled to be addressed in a much more step change way than would otherwise be the case. The challenge for New Zealand is that we don't have a burning platform. Rather, as the old story goes, we have kind of more a boiling frog kind of syndrome. The temperature is gradually rising, but it can be masked from time to time by a rise in something like milk powder prices. And there's a real risk that the temperature will reach boiling point before we notice what's going on. Paul highlighted these issues over recent years, both through his speaking and his writing. He saw that science and innovation held the key to addressing that downward slide. He, of course, understood the science world intimately, but in his later years, he added to those outstanding science skills new areas of entrepreneurialism and then economics. From the insights he gained, it became clear we needed to start thinking differently. In Walter Wetter, for example, he summarised the issue for New Zealand. He noted that more funding and more effective investment instruments are relatively easy to achieve. I'm not quite so sure about that. But what is harder is a culture in which scientific and technological enterprise is valued, where business seeks to innovate, where scientists regard business as a valid outlet for their talents, and where children aspire to be scientists, technologists, and engineers. What Paul's talking about here involves the working of an innovation ecosystem in which the contribution of the various players is recognised and valued. The science system is a vitally important engine inside the innovation ecosystem. It brings research to bear on the big problems and opportunities for industries. It shapes and challenges bright young minds. It makes step change discoveries that impact on our way of life and it connects us to the ideas of the outside world and brings them here. But as Paul highlighted, the science system working alone is not enough. There are other players that have roles as well. It's our businesses that take the good ideas and create jobs for our people. It's our schools that excite our young people about careers in science and entrepreneurship. It's our regional councils that worry about our rivers and our lakes and the nitrogen runoff. It's our incubators 
and our smart, globally connected angel investors that help establish and nourish our new companies. It's our ministries that set social support policies. Now we know that a vibrant science system is critical and that discovery-led science is a vital part of that. But in this area, so is early engagement with other players in the ecosystem to help determine the direction or the directions of travel where value might lie in those discoveries and how IP should then be managed. Strategy-led science is also vital, again alongside other ecosystem players who help define the questions to which answers are sought and then implement those answers when they're found. For our innovation ecosystem to work really well, its members must work as a team. To do this, two things are really important. Firstly, understanding each other's language. To most business people, the language of nanotechnology and genomics is as incomprehensible as the language of the balance sheet and the pricing of products in the global markets is to scientists. In both areas, jargon is the enemy overcoming language barriers critical. Knowledge about the way each ecosystem member thinks is also important. For example, a business doesn't naturally understand that people in universities often have multiple roles to carry out and can't just drop everything at a moment's notice to do something a business wants. While at the same time, a university may not understand the urgency a business has to get a project completed and a product to market when their bank is threatening to cancel their overdraft facility. For our Kiwi Bank people, I'm sure that none of them would do that. Yesterday, in a special place just a bit north of here, we thought about how two different peoples began falteringly to learn each other's language and about the way that each other thought. There were some false steps, but gradually over time with increasing goodwill and respect, and with increasing recognition of the value that each can bring to the other, the understanding and working together has grown. We saw a picture yesterday of the opportunity that now exists to see a step change in our Maori Pakiha relationships in Aotearoa, New Zealand. I'm sure many of us can see a similar opportunity in terms of the relationships between members of New Zealand's innovation ecosystem a step change in communication, understanding, respect and engagement that would then see more of our scientific discoveries being implemented better and faster. We need this step change in the way our ecosystem works as a team. It matters for our prosperity and our well-being and I don't believe we need to wait for a burning platform to trigger it. Paul's vision was that this forum would shift our thinking about the way that science could help us lead this. I don't think this opportunity has ever been better. Thank you. Ena iwi, ena waka, ena mana, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tata koutou. Today I want to talk about the brand positioning uh, of New Zealand. And the big idea is that we need to add another leg to our story, one that's about our smarts and our intelligence and our innovation. New Zealand does actually have a story in the international marketplace. It's well established in the country brand research. For example, the adult country brand research ranks New Zealand 14 out of 50 and having a recognisable brand story. And when you look at the data, our current story has two dimensions or two legs, I call them. Firstly, and not surprisingly, we're known for our environment. Just look out the window. It's uh, pristine, unspoiled, fresh and healthy. That's the reputation anyway. Secondly, interestingly, there's a story about us as a people. There's a story of our integrity, our authenticity, our value system, our hospitality, and increasingly, our cultural richness. This country brand works for us, and both of the dimensions of the story stand us in good stead. And the mega trends of the world that we've been talking about today are making these more valuable, not less. Firstly, the global drive for protein and food security. As China and India come into the cities and the Gulf states go beyond their oil economies, a clean and green image is increasingly valuable. 
The words food safety is on everyone's lips in the emerging economies, and food sustainability is on everyone's lips in the developed economies. The people leg of the story is also very useful positioning. We all know that New Zealand is tiny on a global scale, and no more so than we look at the size of New Zealand companies. In New Zealand, we have a total of 13,000 exporting companies. Sounds like quite a big number. But we've only got 260 companies that export revenue more than 25 million New Zealand dollars. Basically, it's even our big companies are SMEs, small and medium enterprises. So we have no choice but to partner globally for growth. Partner for market access, partner for supply chains, partner for capital, partner for scale. And our character says that we can do partnerships well. Albeit the research says that we're a bit naive and a bit commercially inexperienced. But nonetheless, trustworthy and capable of integrity. Old fashioned values, but I also believe future proof. But there's something missing in the story. And we can also see this in the research. Our intelligence, our innovation, our science does not rank on the country reputation indices. We rank very low on technology, low on a skilled workforce, low on a place to invest, and low on sophistication. Yes, it's a bit harsh and a bit painful to hear. Apart from the fact that it's not true, which I'll come to in a minute, uh, does it matter? Yes, it does matter because of the path that we're on, and I think we've all been alluded, alluding to a similar story here this morning. While our primary commodities are well positioned, we're facing fundamental physical constraints. Essentially, we have a constrained landmass. We're an island. We can improve yield, we can improve productivity, two to three percent each year, year on year, and we can even intensify. But this will not be enough to sustain and improve our way of life. Our path is to be a small country, realistically, probably always with relatively small companies. Focusing on global market niches, moving up value chains, exploring high margin, often branded positions. Often in partnership with big companies, big global companies. Relying on our speed, our agility and our resourcefulness. Underpinned by IP and deep knowledge. As Peter, Sir Peter said, it's a knowledge rich formula. So there's a third leg of our story that is missing a leg based on science and innovation and ingenuity. And it matters because it's not there and because it's central to where we need to go. So is this third leg of the story a pipe dream or is it attainable and realistic? In my new role, and I've been manufacturing commodities for the last 20 years, very unfash unfashionable I know in this audience, but I have. Uh, but over the last 18 months, I've traveled to 32 markets and met face to face with 91 New Zealand internationalizing companies. And the knowledge-rich foundation of our rootstock never fails to amaze me. I'll give you a few examples. Two weeks ago, I was with Orion Health in Spain, viewing their sophisticated health portals and case management systems, which they're implementing in Spain and 20 other countries. And if you can implement something in Spain in this environment, you're doing very well. In Washington, New Zealand has 60 technology companies participating in the supply chains of Lockheed Martin, Boeing, and the US Defence Forces. Engineering companies like Alloy and Fitzroy Yachts, producing some of the best super yachts in the world based on excellence in carbon composites and marine engineering. And most importantly are those that have come from our competitive advantage in primary production. I'll just give you a local example, Gisborne-based Sedenko is developing highly specialised vacuum-fried pumpkin and onion chips, applying locally developed food technology and working with a global partner, PepsiCo, and working with MSI. Our only global scale company, Fonterra and Fonterra Brands, is founded on deep science and their genetics developed through the Livestock Improvement Company has delivered 60% of the improvement in the New Zealand dairy industry productivity. In Italy, I visited Rita, who make the merino fabric for Hugo Boss and Amani, who favour New Zealand merino because it's traceable to the farm gate. In Hawke's Bay, I visited Frost Fans, who have combined America's Cup or, or a nautical and composites technology with horticultural excellence to produce a four-bladed, high energy efficiency, low noise wind tower that's cap uh, captured 80% of the Italian horticultural uh, frost fan market. And the story here is not the backyard inventor or the geek 
for the mad scientist. It's deep institutional knowledge, built up over time, shared amongst companies, a result of systematic public and private investment. It's relevant to market niches and it's adding value and growing our economy. So if we intend to focus on this high value path, and there's not many dissenting voices from that, then we at least need to tell a three-legged story. This is something we, the government, which is uh, the lead agencies in New Zealand Trade and Enterprise and Tourism New Zealand and Education New Zealand have recognised. And under the direction of the Prime Minister and the Minister for Economic Development, Mr Joyce, uh, we've only just started out on this journey. It's a journey that we intend to make with our New Zealand Inc partners and also as a public and private partnership. And something we intend to develop and deliver on in the coming months. So thanks very much for listening. Norera, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tāta katoa. Thank you very much. Now, people who would like to participate in the dialogue, there are two microphones to come up to. I'd encourage you to do so. Perhaps while people are thinking about what they might want to comment on, uh, might just try and draw this together in some way, just for a minute. Uh, I think that what we heard today was a lot of comments about we're not as connected as we think we are. We're not really as internally connected as what we are. If you think about all the tools we use within our science system, a lot of them divide rather than actually bring us together. PBRF, institutional focus, our tendency to be very parochial in New Zealand, our funding system tools, they're all very divisive in the way they operate. And yet we've heard that the advantage and the latent advantage of New Zealand is in multidisciplinarity, in greater connectedness, as Sean talked about, as greater international connectedness, as several of you talked about, at building the divide between science and the creative arts, science and humanities, science uh, in different ways. And so I think there's a, and that it's not just an internal issue of connectedness, although that's something that we can perhaps address more readily. It's also a matter of our external, the way we look at overseas. I think some of the points that Peter made at the end about how, and I think that were also made by, by some of the other speakers, that we're not, we have not yet projected the importance of science and innovation to our own society let alone projected that New Zealand's a clever, a small, clever country to the world, are actually holding us back. And so I, that's my summation of what we've heard from these five speakers. Now, this is meant to be a dialogue. Paul wanted a dialogue. Somebody get up and say something. <laughs> yes, please, Andrew. Or others, come to the microphones and just as you come. Yes. Could it's you introduce... Peter Allport. Um, Paul was a cherished mate of mine, and uh, he was my chief science advisor. If the Prime Minister can have one, why can't I? <laughs> <laughs> Good on you. Um, uh, over a decade ago, I was uh, with Jenny Morell, the co-founder of Number 8 Ventures. And there are a couple of people in, the, in this room that um, there was a connection with there. There were two people that came to see us seeking investment. One of them was Derek Handley, and the other one was Sam Morgan. And we turned both of them down. <laughs> now, I've been in business for about 50 years, so I thought I had a pretty good antennae for good business opportunities, but how thick was I? So I guess my question, or I'd like to address it to the panel or anybody else that wants to speak about it, is this ability to communicate both ways, uh, and I think uh, Murray touched on it, to speak the same language. And I'm not sure that our educational facilities are teaching scientists how to communicate to business people, and I'm absolutely certain that our business schools are not teaching business people or the up-and-coming business people to listen properly to scientists. So I'd like to get some discussion as to how we can do something about that. Paul, as good a scientist as he was, I think his unique ability was to actually translate those concepts. One of my other roles is Paul asked, invited me to be the chairman of Magritech, which was his spin-out company in magnetic 
nuclear magnetic resonance. Now, if it hadn't been Paul that had come and talked to me about that and explained to me what nuclear magnetic resonance was and its business significance, I probably would have said, go away, I'm too busy. So what, I want, I'd, what I'd like to see is some discussion about how we translate and we teach our young scientists and our young business people to be able to talk and listen in the same language. And I think that's absolutely critical in getting the significance of science into our economy. Thank you very much. Anybody want to comment from the, the, the Derek? Uh, Sean, sorry? Yeah, yeah sure. I'd, I'd, um, it's one of my passions is, is science communication as well. Um, you know, I think it, we are putting more emphasis on science communication, and some of the best science communicators I know are PhD students in the McDiamond Institute. I, th I think it's, uh, that change is actually happening, and, and our science students have a, are, are a lot more comfortable talking to a lot you know, a, a wide variety of audiences this day, these days than, than, say, my generation. It's something that I've had to sort of pick up later in life. It certainly wasn't part of my education. Um, and I'll make another comment, perhaps, and that is, you know, one of the, one of the things about New Zealand is we, we have a lot of our scientists in, in Crown Research Institutes. So a lot of our skills and expertise are, are in essentially commercially driven organisations. And there's actually quite a few constraints um, on, on scientists uh, to, to speak um, from, from Crown Research Institutes. And, and I think that's actually something that, you know, we have to change and we have to, um, we have to make our, uh, our science and research organisations much more comfortable with, uh, with letting scientists talk freely and openly with, with a wide variety of communities. Perhaps I could make a comment also. My experience was going to an Israeli incubator, very, very successful, one that Oren Gorstein, who many of you met last year, operated and I looked at the and I thought I was pretty smart at looking at ideas that were commercial and even in the life sciences area he was investing in stuff and making money out of stuff which if I had looked at obviously there's no way and the point I'm trying to make is that I don't think that we have even in either the science or the business community really developed that set of skills that knows how to look where the idea will sell to the world. We may need to partner and bring in people to help us develop these skills. The Israelis make an, made, uh, made another comment to me is, you've got your business schools modelled on the Harvard model. The Harvard model's about large companies. That's what they train people to work for. They work, train people to work for GE or for, uh, for JP Morgan or something. They don't train people to work with SMEs. Your, your business school model is wrong for your society. Think again. Again, that's a challenge for the vice chancellors and the universities to think about. They're not training people in the way we need. Murray, do you want to comment more? Yeah, I think this is a real passion of mine, Peter, as you know. I think uh, I see so many examples where we listen and we have scientists inside our organisation who understand what the scientists are talking about. We have business people inside our organisation who understand what the business world is talking about. There are just so many latent opportunities to put those two groups of people together in rooms and have dialogue. And I'm just sitting here thinking, wouldn't it be great to start some fora for young scientists and young business people to actually start putting in a room together, maybe with just a glass of wine, maybe nothing much more than that would be needed. But maybe if we started some of those across the country, it might be quite interesting to see what came out of them, mightn't it? That's the kind of thing. So we, I think we should look at this question from two levels. One, you're right, Peter, the systemic kind of, okay, what changes do we need to think about in our business schools? What changes do we need to think in our science curricula inside our universities and our schools, but also how do we do the informal stuff, the soft stuff? Andrew Cleland. Yes, look, I would just like to share some of my discussions with Paul Callahan over the last three to four years. And it was a simple discussion in many ways, but I think very powerful. Paul used to get frustrated with the use of the word or rather than the use of the word and. And I think we need to change our conversation. This comes back to Peter's theme of connectedness. It's not a choice of the biological sector and tourism or manufacturing or energy and resources. It's and, and, and. And it's about the highest environmental standards and it's about meeting our cultural values. Because quite simply, other countries don't get to the top by neglecting one of their, one of their strengths, one of their assets. And we tend to have this divided conversation which we do this or that. 
I've heard so many people say, we don't need this because we can do it all this other way. And the simple truth of the matter is we need to get into an and conversation in this country. It's this and that and that and that. Because quite simply, if you tie your hands behind your back by neglecting something, we're never going to win. And that was a discussion Paul and I had many times. And I think it's just worth reflecting that back into the room today. Thanks, Andrew. Yes. Maureena Tato, uh, I'm Jenny Harray Hindmarsh. I live here on the East Coast after um, many years in Wellington and grew up in the Rangatike. My current part time job is research coordinator for Ngati Pro Hauora, the health service on the coast. And one of the key issues that uh, I think the rich discussion uh, from the panel uh, raised for me that I just want to um, uh, make at this point to get it right up front in the conversation for these two days um, I'll get to in one minute but I just want to preface it by saying that the two key summary themes that leapt out at me was our panel collectively were talking about um, four P's and four C's that were critical for getting us from where we're at to where we want to be as fast as possible building on science and scholarship and those I picked up were people, planet, profits, and place, underlined. Uh, connectivity, collaboration, or partnership. Competitive advantage, complex products. Now I'd add another P and another C. Participation and community. And communication is part of all that. Now, sitting here on the East Coast for the last eight years and building from here the attempts to collaborate, partner, and the rich connect up the dots, there's rich, innovative intellectual property sitting here. And I was really struck. Sean, thanks for putting up your physicist diagrams. Wow, they spoke to me. My key point I want to keep on the agenda here is that the new world, because I understand your date is probably on till now, is I'd love to see a similar diagram building in that we have connectivity via the internet that can be face to face. We are building in, we have got gone, gone Google Cloud. We've got Google Chat, we're linking up now with our research team meetings with the University of Otago, <coughs> University of Auckland, Waikato, for our face-to-face -face research team meetings, for our face-to-face -face building our research funding application planning. And then connectivity is critical here. We need fast broadband up the coast right now, not the last people <laughs> for, to get that. And I would love to see your diagram. I reckon if we built that in, that connectivity is a given, we, I love your phrase, let's have a city of four million, but I wouldn't use city. Let's have a community that's innovative of four million and keep critical mass in place like this. We don't need everyone in cities like Auckland where we end up putting all our resources into infrastructural projects. That's my point. Thank you. Thank you. Peter Dearden. Um, hi, I'm uh, Peter Den, and I have a confession to make that I am a scientist, um, um, which is no bad thing, really. But um, what, what I want to say is that uh, the problem here is, is, I think, an operational one. We have this issue that actually we have a lot of scientists in this country, and our scientists are really good. They're smart people. They do really good work, but often they're stuck in their labs focusing on small problems because they do not have the time or they do not have the encouragement of the institutions they work for to make connections. Right? Making uh, connections with business is not a trivial matter for a scientist. We have to learn the language they speak and, and moderate our language. Language is a really important aspect of that, but it is building long-term relationships which people can trust. Right? As a scientist, I'm evil. Right? I'm a geneticist too. It's even worse. Right? <laughs> so instantly, the public goes, Peter Dearden, he's an evil man. And, and it's about <laughs> making those connections and sitting down in a room for years and talking to people. And my institution doesn't value that very well, um, but it is enormously effective. What we need to do is find some better way, if we want to have better interface between scientists and business and better collaborations between them, to find mechanisms whereby those relationships can be built and they can be built solidly, that science is seen not as this weird guy on the outskirts 
of an innovation system, but as integral to it and useful and sensible. We need to have scientists on the boards of companies. We need the universities to think about ways to get their scientists out into the community, both you know, talking to community groups and, and, but also in the boardrooms of business. And we need the business people on, in the boardrooms of universities. And I think that that's where we're missing, that, that critical thing. And it's not, it doesn't seem to me there's a philosophical issue here. It's just how are we going to achieve that and how are we going to resource that? And that's what we're missing. Carol? Yeah, couldn't agree more. And you, you're a geneticist. Try being an economist. You know, <laughs> not a party trick. Um, I couldn't agree more. And I think that the problem is in, in our systems, in our science systems, it's not just New Zealand. We're actually encouraging the silos and, and discouraging mm. these discussions to take place. And I'll pick it up even for scientists to talk to scientists, because I was banging on before about transdisciplinarity. It takes a lot longer. So, you know, for the incentive for the institution and the scientist, to allow us to go out and talk. And I know I've been involved in transdisciplinary research programs for a while, but you have to allow that time of building up and trust. And that's scientist to scientist, never mind getting out to business. One, I would change, uh, the, the, I love the word and, um, and I love the word that, um, you know, when I think of the PBRF, that encourages people, you know, to publish in North American journals, to not think about New Zealand focused research, to not get out of their narrow area. That's something we could fix, because that's fantastic. Let those people do that kind of research. But can't we have and as well, celebrate the people who are going out to business and celebrate those connections? So I think, the, I think scientists will do it. As you say, we've got to change the incentive structures um, to the universities and to the scientists. I think that's a very good point. Uh, uh, you know, all my experience of relationships between scientists and relationships between science and business is it needs as much attention as any other kind of interpersonal relationship. It may take more because you've got different languages to cross and we don't do it well from New Zealand at all. Over, sir. Oh, hello, yes, uh, Kim Campbell from the Employers and Manufacturers in Auckland. If the scientists want to talk to business, come and see us. Uh, but I'm mindful of, of Peter Crisp's comments that uh, overseas we're seen as a nice country, but not a, a cerebral one. And what brings me to mind that perhaps it's got something to do with the dumbing down of our university system. And does the panel perhaps think that we have too many universities that are not well enough funded? That there might be an argument to go perhaps to the Scandinavian or Swiss model where they have research-based institutions, a relatively small number of them, and then have vocational institutions which serve the needs of the business community, which are specifically oriented and uh, funded to the needs of the society in general. Do you really want to pick that one up? I feel very vulnerable all of a sudden. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps I'll, I'll just make a, a little bit of a, you know, this is, this is a bit self-serving because I work for the McDiamond Institute and you'll see a banner up there. But, um, you know, one of the things that, that I think has succeeded in New Zealand and has been... And actually, I will just say, you know, collaboration is increasing. It's really interesting when I look at the metrics over the last decade, you know, we are collaborating more. You know, a lot of what we're, what we're talking about is actually happening, which is really encouraging. But then uh, the McDiamond Institute um, is something that I think actually does partly uh, uh, meet this goal of bringing people together. It hasn't, you know, McDiamond is a, it's a virtual research centre, so we have re researchers at Auckland University, uh, Massey University, Victoria University, Industrial Research Limited, Geological Nuclear Scientists, Canterbury University, and Otago. Um, and, and we've been able to build an internationally uh, competitive organisation um, that has an international profile by bringing people together, you know, the best people together uh, in one group. So I don't ne necessarily think we need to uh, be axing universities um, to achieve this international scale. We can do it in other ways. Oh, can I stick my neck out? Yeah, absolutely. Um, God, a bit stupid. Why do they do that? Anyway, um, yeah, I think, you know, I th Minister Joyce has quite an interesting phrase. He said, we do uh, small country uh, bad. What does he say? We do big country. We do big country badly. In other words, we try and have infrastructures, arrangements, uh, democratic arrangements that are way, way bigger than the four and a half million people that we are. And I, it beggars me why uh, we've got one sort of vet school and four law schools. It, it just does. I mean, and it, cause we all got to pay for this stuff. We all got to pay for this stuff. And productivity, which no matter whether you're chasing niches or chasing commodity, fundamental productivity and economy will be one of the things we need to go forward. If we can't get the basic cost structure down of our provision to ourselves of all our arrangements, 
uh, then I think we're fooling ourselves. So if we can see very obvious duplication, major duplication in the system, we have to put our hands up and say it's not right. So I think Kim's raising a very good point. In the interest of time, we're going to move on, please. Uh, my name is Nicole Moore, and I'm from one of those four law schools. I'm an academic <laughs> in Victoria. Um, I'm wanting to pick up on a couple of themes. One is connectivity, and the other is the discussion that's beginning to emerge about the performance-based research fund, which we're all, which for those of you who don't know, academics every six years have to talk about what they've, uh, will have to put in a very detailed portfolio of what they've produced in the last six years, and the university funding is partly dependent on um, the results of that exercise. And I think there's, there's some good things about that, and particularly the sense that it um, focuses on the importance of research, but there are also some negatives. I had a, a, um, a rather disappointing experience recently where the, a book was written out of Auckland University on the area which I've specialised in for the last 12 years. And I wrote to my colleagues at Victoria and Canterbury, who I knew were experts in the area, to say, am I completely out of the loop? Because I hadn't, didn't even know this was being published, and none of them knew. And I think that that's partly... The, because of the PBRF, I think it does I, I set us up slightly in competition to each other. And that if that is what, um, if that's happening, if that's an experience which is wider than mine, then I think that we need to look at the, to ensure that that structure is not um, creating disincentives to what we need here, which is actually more collaboration rather than less. So that's just a comment. Um, I don't know if any of the panel members have anything they want to say about that. I I would only say from my own experience, I've seen institutions within the university sector where they're within one department, there are groups doing the same research and not talking to each other because of it. So, you know, there are some real issues. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, it has no doubt changed the focus of the academics realising that they're not there just to, in a luxury status, they have to contribute back to mm -hmm. society. So there are issues here, and I think it will be reviewed after the after the current round, things may, there may be changes. I think the minister, I'm conscious of time, and we've got to finish this session because of the, the thing that's going on. So I'm going to take one last comment from here and, and any quick response to it. Just, I'm sorry, I think we have at least another hours of discussion here, and I think that highlights what Paul wanted, which was a good dialogue. I'm just sorry that with the, the program as it is, we, we should have two and a half days, not one and a half days. Yeah, uh, my name is Roger Horrocks. I just wanted to uh, say that one of the most important points that I thought had come out of the session is talking about the need for better communication between science and business because we're talking across different cultures and different vocabularies. But I think I'd also like to extend that really strongly that between science and the humanities is an equally difficult, uh, an equal obstacle and I think the team that organised this conference um, is exceptional in that respect. I think of Sir Paul um, and also Glenda and Lydia and Bill Manhai and the others who worked on this forum have worked exceptionally hard, I think, to talk across the humanities and science. And if you look at today's knowledge economy and today's creative industries, it's a huge growth area. And boundaries between subjects are becoming increasingly interdisciplinary. So I think I just want to stress that that also, from my experience, is a real problem and we need to keep working on it. Thank you. Thank you very much. What a splendid place to end a marvellous morning, uh, although you heard too much from me. I just remind you all to come back at 10.20. Thank you very much, panel.